I'm just going to make this kind of brief, but when I was growing up, I grew up being dyslexic. I couldn't read. I couldn't write. And um, since I was in second grade, I was in special ed class. <clears throat> and um, I ended up, I'm, 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 bi I'm, I'm multiracial. My father is Singapore Chinese. My mother is Polish American. And so I'm, I'm, I'm mixed. I grew up in the church, but um, uh, I never really had a personal relationship with God because I felt hurt by the church. And not only hurt by the church, but, um, you know, when I, was, when I was younger, I moved to New Zealand when I was 11 years old. And in New Zealand, the first day at school, um, I, started, I started to um, encounter racism so me and my younger brother who went to the same school, we were getting, um, you know, there was a lot of verbal abuse going on and physical abuse with my younger brother. And because of that, I started to fight. I started to fight to defend ourselves, to defend me, defend my younger brother. And I really pushed God. I, I knew God exists. I knew he was real. But I just really thought, how can God let abuse happen to me and my younger brother? And um, I really had a distrust of God and actually blamed God for what I went through. But because of that, I learned to fight. And at a, and actually 11 years old, uh, me and another guy uh, put a gang together called the SBs. And we were in Mangade, Auckland at, at Royal Oak School. And at 13 years old, <clears throat> my family left and we moved to Penang, Malaysia. And in Penang, Malaysia, because of where I was mentally, um, um, education, like I said, I was dyslexic, I couldn't read. Um, I, my, 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 my examination scores to see where I was average through the nation, I think I was bottom 12% or 13%. Bottom 12 or 13%, okay, I'm, on my scoring exam. So it's, it's to, to kind of evaluate where I am. So that tells you right there, I had, I had problems in school. But anyways, at, at, um, um, I, I joined a local triad, which is a Chinese mafia or Chinese secret society. I got recruited into one when I was uh, 13 years old. And I was in the Chinese mafia um, for, for, for quite some years. And, I, and my goal in the Chinese mafia was to raise in the ranks. And I wanted to become a Thai Lo. That was my dream, was to become a Thai Lo, become a boss in the Chinese triads. And if you know about Penang, Malaysia, the city is an island, is about 1.5 million people, maybe 1.7 million people. And there's, there's a lot of Chinese gangs out there. It's a Chinese mafia. And uh, I got kicked out of school at 13. So before, I never even finished eighth grade. So my ninth grade, I was already out of school. And so my boss, um, in, 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 in the Chinese triad said, Chobi, because you're out, I'm going to train you. I'm going to train you to be, uh, uh, um, you know, to learn about the ways of the Chinese triad. And so I learned the ways of the Chinese triads from everything, from how to dress, all kind of different stuff. I mean, I was really groomed to be the poster boy in the Chinese triad in Penang, Malaysia. And from then on, you know, I, I just, I, I, I thought this is going to be my life. This is my future. Um, and because I couldn't, I couldn't study. Um, and I felt abandoned by God. Uh, and all this stuff like that. My I misconceptions of who he was. I just sinked myself deeper and deeper into the underground network. And, um, and how everything worked. So the Chinese triads are involved in everything. They're involved in prostitution. They're involved in white collar crime and different things like that. They have a heavy, heavy influence inside um, Penang, Malaysia. And, and, and I was just getting it immersed. But me and my group, we were more of just the fighters inside our Chinese group. And so every time there was a problem, we were down there and we were ready to fight all the time. And um, so by the time I was 17, um, we left back to America and I was planning only to come back for maybe a year and then go back to Malaysia. But I, as um, I was back here in America, um, I actually went to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania 
and I had a feeling that my girlfriend back in Malaysia was cheating on me. So I called up my boss in Malaysia and I said, hey, he, you know, I call him Tylo. You know, you know, so we call the bosses over there. But I said, can you please find out if, if my girlfriend is cheating on me? About a day later, he gave me a call and said, Chobi, she's cheating on you. And so I remember that night, I started tearing my room up. I started smack. I mean, I was so upset because the, guy, the girl she cheated with was someone that I knew. And I bought a plane ticket and I called her and I said, listen, I want you to tell that guy I got a present coming for him. And I was going to go fly back and take care of him. And so anyways, I bought a plane ticket. And as I was about to leave the door of my house, okay, to enter the car, to go to the airport, to fly back to Malaysia, my mother was waiting outside the door. And she said to me, she said, son, I don't know if I'll ever see you again. Because she knew, okay, that God spoke to her before that I was going to die in Malaysia. That's why they end up leaving to come to America. But here I was trying to fly back. Okay. And she said, I told God, Lord, do whatever it takes in his life to get him on track. And I remember when she said that it did something to me. It actually put this fear in me because I never seen my mom like that before. And I remember getting on the airplane i had this little small bible that one of my friends long time ago from malaysia gave to me and i always kept that bible because who that guy meant to me when he gave that bible to me i always kept it but i never could read but i just kept the bible and i remember bringing that bible with me on the airplane to fly back to malaysia and, I, and my, in my mind i nothing but hate and murder for especially for this guy that i was going back to see and in the airplane, I would get this fear, this anxiety, because in the airplane, I have no control. And I was a person that thrived on control because control to me was my, was my, was my comfort because I felt like my life was so out of control growing up that control was my comfort. And I opened the Bible up just to see, just to flip through the pages. And in what I saw, okay, that popped out to me. It said this, it said, in three days, I will heal your wounds. And I couldn't read, but I saw these words come out. In three days, I will heal your wounds. And I've never seen that back in the Bible again. So I don't know if, I think God was just, God was speaking to me during the time. So I closed the Bible and I remember in the airplane, I said, God, if you heal me in three days, okay, I'm not going to go after this guy. And so... I remember I, I landed in my airplane and um, I remember three days went past and every day my, I was so angry and I just wanted to go get machetes and go after this guy. And I remember the second day I was laying in bed thinking tomorrow is the third day. And if I wake up and I got this anger, I'm going after him. And I remember I woke up the next day and there was this peace that I couldn't understand. It was a peace that I felt over this burning sensation over my heart that was gone. It put that burning sensation out. And I woke up, I thought, man, I think God took this away. I think God actually healed me. And I think now he really spoke to me in the airplane. So I spent about a month there in Malaysia. And I was thinking about, I was thinking about what happened, right? But, but um, I ended up, ended up hanging out with, my, with the triad. And um, I went to a club, and I was with two other guys. And my friend comes to me and says, Chobi, there's, I have some rivals here in the club. And I said to him, I said, bro, I really don't want to fight right now. I just want to show up a good time, drink at the club. You know, we've got bottles and all this. And, and anyways, um, the club closes, and we ended up going to a place where we're eating food on the side of the street. So we're eating food, you know, we're having makan, we're just having a good time, just eating up. And all of a sudden, the car, this car pulls up. And these same rivals of a different Chinese mafia comes over and sits down to a table next to us. And my friend looks at me and says, Chobi, you ready to fight? I said, let's go. And we started fighting these guys. Fight, 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 fight. Beat them up. Whatever. Chairs were flying everywhere. And, um, um, and then we leave. The next day, I get a phone call. And my friend calls me and says, Chobi, he says, I'm at... 
I'm at um, a mall here, Gurney Plaza. Um, if you guys are from Penang, you know where Gurney Plaza is. That used to be our area or our triads area. And they said these guys are here and they're looking for you because you got you, you fought those guys last night. So I went over to this mall, right? And I met the two guys I was with before. And I was going to go up to the, the top floor where there's a billiard, a, a pool, like a snooker center. And my, my boss was there waiting for me to figure out what was going on. So we had guys up there waiting for me and the couple guys that I was with. And I'm at the elevator on the first floor. And I all of a sudden, I see guys start walking next to me. And they're, they're walking, they're walking. I don't know who they are. They don't recognize me and I don't recognize them. But as I'm waiting for the elevator to come down, I can see the elevator numbers, five, four, three, two, one. And all of a sudden, the elevator opens up and that gang who was looking for me at Gurney Plaza was inside the elevator. And these guys walk out and they start talking to the guys behind me. So I know that the, this triad is grouping right there where I'm at. And as they come out, I'm surrounded because I got guys behind me and the guys in the elevator. And they, as they walk out, me and my two friends, we walk inside the elevator. And the only guy that recognized us I can see him because his face was beat up. As he's walking out, he turns his head and he's talking in Chinese that these are the guys that he that beat him up last night. So these guys, so me and my two friends are in the elevator, and these guys outside the elevator start shouting, shouting, shouting. Long story short, the boss over there, I, I just I just at the same time when they're shouting, I felt this power. I felt I felt this presence that was around me, and I felt death. I cannot explain what the spirit of death feels like, but I just felt death was right there. I felt like this was the moment I was going to die. And I knew that I was such an evil person because 11 years old all the way till now, I was, an, I was a hardcore gangster. I was about drugs. I was getting involved people in the Chinese mafia, destroyed lives. I mean, I was an evil person and I just knew... At that moment, I felt like this was my time that I was going to die. Okay? And I felt like I was going to meet God. And at this thing, I'm, I'm, and, 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 and it was such a spiritual time. And I was trying to ignore it because I got this gang in front of me. So it was something that was really awkward for me for, for this to happen. And I just thought to myself, if I die right now, I'm going to go to hell. Because I don't know who God is. I have nothing invested in God. I have everything invested only in my own life and what I've built as trying to be a boss in the gang, trying to be a hardcore gang member and all this stuff. And so all of a sudden, this guy in front of me who was their boss pulls out a machete in his back. He had a machete and he pulls it out and we're in the middle of the mall and he's pointing it to our necks, pointing to our face. And he's trying to get us to go to this parking lot, okay, at Gurney Plaza and later on, we found out that they had cars up there, okay, two, three cars full of machetes, full of samurai swords, waiting. They're trying to kidnap us to go there so they could, hap they could, they could chop us up. But at that moment, we were telling them we're not, we're not going anywhere and all this. And all of a sudden, I remember stepping back and I thought to myself, man, that's so crazy because I'm, everything started happening so fast. But I thought about the spirit of death and now this guy pulled the machete out and I thought this is my time. I took one step back and I just said, Jesus, you got to save me. I, I prayed that real silently. Jesus, please save me. And there was a guy, actually a guy that was from our triad that saw the group and he walked towards the group and he held the guy back when he found out that we were with the same triad. And he held the guy back with the machete. And I remember when he held the guy back with the machete, we were able to get out. And I just remember thinking that night, to myself, man, this was totally a God thing. The next, so I called out to Jesus and I saw that he saved me from a machete. The next day I go to a club and I'm taking ecstasy. And I, I used to love to pop pills and I remember taking ecstasy and I, I don't know what I took, but my body was dying. And I remember I was exiting this club, I was sitting on this chair and I could feel the coldness of death and the same spirit of death that I felt the day before showed up. And now I really started to panic because I remember what happened the day before when I felt the spirit of death. Now I felt the spirit of death again. Like I said, I can't explain it, but if you're there, you, if you've been there, you know what I'm talking about. And I remember 
thinking to myself, man, I'm going to die right now and see God. And God just saved me the day before. And I remember looking to the sky and I said, Lord, you got to save me. And Jesus saying, please, God. And I remember that life went back in my body and I sobered up. I got on my chair and I felt, I felt 100% fine. And my friends were like, Shobi, you okay? And I said, I think G Jesus just saved me. I said, I called out to Jesus and he just saved me. They thought I was crazy. But I knew inside my heart what was going on. The third day, the next day, it's the third thing that happened. I was going down, uh, I, was, I was in my friend's car, right? But before I got in his car, he pulls up. He was my right-hand man in the Chinese triad. I could see I have my right-hand man and my left-hand man. He was the guy that was taking care of my group I was back in America. He pulls up in his car and I heard a voice. And the voice said, put on your seatbelt. And usually I would never put on my seatbelt, right? But I got in the car and I put, on, put my seatbelt on. And he looks at me and says, Chobi, he says, you don't trust my driving? Why put your seatbelt on? Because he knew I never put my seatbelt on. And I said, you should put your seatbelt on too. He put his seatbelt and we're going down, down this road and we're following another car that's in front of us. We're, we're kind of like racing. <clears throat> and the car in front of us, who's also our friends inside, they started stopping because of traffic. And my friend, <clears throat> he couldn't slow down fast enough, right? So his car started to slide. And the car went like a 90 degree angle. So it went from going on the road to cutting off the road at 90 degrees. And we jumped off the sidewalk. And I remember that split second when he lost control of the car. I thought about the last two days about what happened to me. About calling out to Jesus and him saving me. And I thought to myself, my life flashed before my eyes at that, at that moment of losing control. And I thought... I'm going to see God's judgment. I'm going to see him. I don't know him. And I, and I just, and I remember blacking out. And I woke up after blacking out in this car and the whole windshield was smashed and there was leaves everywhere. And there was a pole. My head was actually hanging to the side because there was a pole that came through the windshield and it cut the, it cut some of my forehead. And I look, and I look over to my friend and he's going through a seizure. His eyes are rolled back. He has blood coming down his head and he's just shaking. And I thought, I got to get my friend out of the car. It's the first thing I thought about. So I popped my seatbelt off. I don't know what we hit, but I, I just knew that our car was really bad because I, I, I knew the speed that we were going, no matter what we hit, I thought to myself, we're dead because of, of the impact. But I opened the car door and I fall on the ground about eight feet and I don't know why we felt I fell I, I get off the ground and I look at this car and this car is sitting in between two tree branches the car literally jumped off the sidewalk from the road okay and then after the after the sidewalk was about a five feet drop and it, and and, it, and the car landed in between these two tree branches so the car was snuggle snug into this tree Okay, the front of the tree, or the front of the car hit this house. And that thing that hit my, went past my head, almost took my head off, was, was this pole that was hold, a beam from the house. So I get off the floor, and these, these villagers, Malay villagers come out. They get my friend out of the car. And I remember my friend is laying, he's laying in my lap, and he's, and he's bleeding everywhere. And he's, and he's passing out. He's losing consciousness. And he tells me, he says, Chobi, please tell my family I love them. And he, he was saying, I can't feel my legs. And he, he was saying his last words. And I, and, and, I, and I said, God, what do I do? And he said, pray for him. I heard a voice say, pray for him. So I started praying for him, praying for him, praying for him. I go in the ambulance. We get to the hospital. And my friend goes through for brain surgery. Because he had a, a blood clot in the brain. And I, I'm in the hospital bed and I remember thinking about everything that happened to me with the machete to my neck, with the overdose, with the car accident. And every time I remember, I thought about God and the name of Jesus brought a physical salvation to me. And I knew at that moment that I wanted salvation. I wanted to be, I wanted to know more about God. I, at this point, God's reality became, became existing to me. And I remember in the hospital bed, I said, God, I want, I want you. I want to know more about you. I want, and I couldn't believe that God had so much mercy on me who called on his name, even though I was a hardcore gangster 
a hardcore gangster, okay? But Jesus saved me when I called to him in the craziest time when I did not deserve it. He saved my life and here I am in the hospital and I gave my life to him. And I found a peace of God, a fulfillment in my life. I, I knew that when I asked God into my heart, what he did at that very second, I knew I walked into my destiny. I flew back to America and I could not read the Bible, but when I, when I opened the Bible up, right, I felt this heat come over my head. I just said, God, I don't know how to read. I'm eight, 17, 18 years old. I don't know how to read. I pray that you will use your word to bring healing to my mind. And I remember every day I would open the Bible and I started to read the Bible. God started healing my mind, healing my mind. He broke the drugs in my life. Right? He, 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 he healed me from being dyslexic. Six months later, God started changing me so much. He asked me to go back and quit the mafia. So I flew back and I quit the mafia. And that's a whole big story to itself that how God protected me. And even as I was doing it, I could feel the spirit of God with me in front of my boss. And I had to get out of the Chinese mafia traditional way, you know. But God gave me favor and I was able to share about Jesus, okay, to my Tai Lo at the time. You know what I mean? And um, maybe he's watching right now. I don't know. But he knows that, you know, I love him and everything else. But um, um, day after that, I called out the whole gang that was under me in Gurney Plaza to have a gang meeting. And I took that time to share about Jesus. And I told everybody I quit. So I, got, I had about 30 guys, maybe more at the meeting maybe 35, and I told all of them that God changed my life and I'm sorry for getting you guys involved and being, you know, your leader and, and I'm done. I quit. I told them I came out. And after that, God did more healing to me emotionally. He showed me my identity, that I'm a son of the king. I live a new life, right? And we just share about the Lord and, and um, it hasn't always been easy, but I just want to share a little bit of my story to encourage you. Do ne never neglect the name of Jesus. Never neglect or doubt that he is right there with you. Even though you've been through a bad circumstance, he is right there. Ask him to teach you the truth. Ask him to show himself to be reality. And if you truly believe that in your heart, salvation will come in your life. Fulfillment will come in your life. Purpose will come in your life. Truth will come into your life. Healing will come into your life. I don't care what you've been through. Okay, I was depressed. My parent, my family couldn't believe I started to smile. They thought I was on another drug. Okay, but it was the Holy Spirit. It was God that came into my life. The love of God, right, that transformed a person. Even if you have PTSD, okay, I had, believe me, my mind was so screwed up because of the things in the gang, okay? Post-traumatic -traum stress. God healed me. He allowed me to sleep. He allowed me to love other people. You imagine, I used to hate people, but now I'm loving people. Why? Because when God comes in, no, their doctors may say nothing will change in your life or it is impossible. Let me tell you, the healing of God is possible. He is the ultimate authority. And, and if, you, if you reach out to God and say, God, I want you to, to show yourself. Let me see if you're real, Lord. Okay? And if you truly mean it, if you have an inner uh, desire for it, the true God is real. He will reveal his reality to you. And let me tell you, he will bring you out of the pit that you are in. I hope this is a blessing to you. Guys, God bless. And um, yeah, reach out to the Lord. He's right there. Believe me, he loves you more than you think. Take care.